Um, thank you for you all being here, uh, especially uh, Professor Boyana Kunst, CSEC, Professor Encarnacion for doing this uh, um, gathering, let's say. Um, I will try, is it okay my voice that everyone is hearing? Okay. Um, so I will show um, an ongoing research, it's not finished yet, so you will see that there are points um, missing and I'll point out and this could be really good opportunity for me to f feel how you feel about it and for us to discuss. So it's really a place for a discussion and if you have to interrupt me, don't don't hesitate to do so if I'm speaking things that you don't know uh, because I'm talking about the Brazilian context. So um, I'll divide my uh, talk in two parts. First one, uh, a brief contextualization of the situation in Brazil right now, which is already very complex to do so. So um, I'll try to point out some things. Uh, and then a second part, which is actually, I brought two um, examples of feminist and uh, indigenous struggle in Brazil, and I'll try to articulate it to artistic context uh, in terms of seeing where um, these struggles could meet and where they really have divisions and separations. So the, the work from now, the framework is, is about discussing this. How can we, can we learn something from grassroots social movements? Can artistic context really uh, embrace these uh, subjects or not? So the fundamental question, I think, is about change. Is, is, is it art the, the place for a social transformation? And if not, where does it happen? And how to deal with this idea of change? So this, the, the first part of the Brazilian context, the, I started this research in 2016. So the very moment of the coup in Brazil, um, in an already changing and dismantling uh, moment for leftist policies in politics in Brazil that, um, I mean, lasted for uh, 12 years. Uh, and th with the impeachment of uh, President Dilma Rousseff, we, we lost two years uh, for the uh, Temer government. So these uh, 12 years of leftist uh, government brought up a lot of important changes and uh, for grassroots uh, social movements, it, it was a very important moment for establishing and for really exercising things that have been uh, discussed and dealed in the, in, not in the political, uh, governmental, public sphere, let's say, public po uh, politics for the past uh, 30 years. So since the dictatorship, the, actually the, the opening of the dictatorship in 85, uh, there was this really uh, grassroots movement gathering and discussing um, that uh, turned out the, constitu the, the, the constitution of 1988, which is a very progressive one, but also a very difficult one to put in practice. And only in this um, leftist uh, moment it was possible to see some of these policies really uh, in, in action and it already, already changed a lot. For example, I, the first time I was in public university in the 90s, there was really the, the installation of the new liberals, liberalism in Brazil, the first trial, let's say, and you could see really middle class, uh, white, mixed race people as students and as professors. And when I came back to take my master in 2012, so the, the, the leftist government began in 2003, so already 10 years, um, it was a completely different situation. A lot of uh, institutions 
educational institutions, just to stick with the educational part, uh, opened in various places in Brazil, not only in capitals, but really in, in rural areas. And you see, I could see a change, a real change in the students, uh, more indigenous, more black, more women uh, taking part in this educational field. So, um, but for the research, uh, I will deal with uh, 2013, which is also a very specific moment in political situation in Brazil, because uh, it's known as the year of the June days. And the June days were massive uh, street demonstrations that we had all over Brazil, not only in capitals. I will uh, show some extracts from Rio de Janeiro, and I will talk from Rio de Janeiro, but it's, it's a, a national movement, actually, which uh, the, the meaning of this demonstration is, is still something open to discussion, because it, it varies from autonomists to indigenous to leftists, Criticals of uh, the, the politics of then, and also the right wing, the, the, this rise of the right wing was already, you could feel. But in that moment, in 2013, we were really together on streets, and it was more like uh, uh, a confusing moment of everyone together. That's one thing important to say. Um, so, uh, for example, leftist movements still today uh, don't acknowledge that 2013 was also a, a critical moment of the policies of leftist governments. For example, in relations to indigenous land, which I will talk a, a little bit about, about it, uh, leftist governments were the, the governments who less um, created uh, uh, reserved spaces for indigenous. And for me, it was really shocking to learn this. How could the, a leftist mo movement do not support the indigenous reserve, but it was linked to the agribusiness. So it was also uh, this uh, specific idea of development, of commodities development, uh, very much um, related to agribusiness. And agribusiness is the, the opposite from in the indigenous struggle because it's monoculture, it's like extracting from the soil, and it's banishing, uh, expropriating land from indigenous people. Just for you to understand how complex is this a situation, it's not only left or right, uh, good or bad, and you will see that I, I will, um, in the research, start to abandon this idea of left and right, which is uh, very problematic nowadays uh, for us to, to think. I like this uh, formulation of Boa Ventura Sousa Santos, uh, which is a, a Portuguese sociologist. He said that until 2016, in Brazil, we had uh, representative democracy and social fascism already. Uh, but this has already changed. So uh, I took the um, choice of not entering this debate, but trying, as you will see, to talk more in a political economic perspective. Uh, so 2014 was the, the year where, where the crisis in economy was really deep uh, in Brazil. It's like the, we are for the first time feeling the impact of 2008 mondial crisis, world crisis. So we, ha we could still have some years of growth in uh, economical uh, perspective, but 2014 14 was already unbearable. Also with the results from this uh, year 2013. 
Um, and then we had uh, Dilma Rousseff impeachment and also a big debate about coup in Brazil. Was it coup? Was it not coup? Was it legal? Was it not legal? And now the, the, with the following years, I think we are seeing <laughs> where, it, where is it going. Uh, so I take part that there was really a coup in Brazil, but it's also an open question for many intellectuals and many um, uh, social um, analyzers. And 2015 is also the, the year that marks really huge feminist movements on street. So that's, that is uh, also a very important year for, for me because as you will see, I will show some of them, some of demonstrations and their questions. Uh, another important year, 2018, the execution of Councilwoman Marielle Franco. Marielle Franco was elected uh, for this term, 2018, and could have one year of um, term until she was uh, executed in still unsolved cases, but now more um, broadly said that with connections with paramilitary uh, forces in Rio de Janeiro and also with the actual pres President Bolsonaro. So uh, for me, Marielle Franco, I was uh, supporting her campaign as a volunteer in 2017. And the way I saw that she could relate to grassroots social movements and this political institution really astonished me as a really renewed relationship. So I will also bring one case of this, um, this term. And 2019, Bolsonaro in power, and we are still figuring out new arrangements of resistance. So now I will show you a, a small extract of uh, June 2013 in Rio de Janeiro, just to see the atmosphere of it. Wait, wait. No. How can I put it? Where's the video? Wait. The video was here. Yes. Is it? No. 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 Yes? Oh, sorry. Pega aí esse imperialismo do caralho. Você acha que filha da puta? Porra, isso não tem nada, cara. Ok, just for you to... I, I was 
on street that moment and I had a mix of uh, fear and joy for being uh, a lot of people together but also fear of the police as you can see police in Brazil police is not that sweet and it's uh, all over the world but in Brazil uh, we have really strong connections still with dictatorship and also the military policies is very um, let's say doing uh, very lasting uh, strategies from the time of dictatorship who, who should have already banished but they are still in use like a, a torture and not um, respecting human rights okay so um, as I said I was going to one moment in the research I would like to um, slide from the idea of art and politics which was the, fir the first idea that I had to work on into art and social movements and interested on grassroots movements, the feminist, the lesbian and the urban indigenous movements that I will show and how to address so social change. This is my main question. How does art address so social change and how does grassroots movements do the same and in different manners? So from that time, from uh, art and politics, uh, let's say relation, I still um, am reading some fundamental uh, authors for me uh, such as uh, uh, Benjamin, author as a producer, uh, Kamnitzer, which is um, he's Argentinian, but he works in America. He talks about contemporary colonial art in 1969, so it's the situation of Latin American art in regards to, in that moment, imperialism. Uh, the artist as the ethnographer is also a, an, a, a supporting text that's that's problematic in a good way still giving us some uh, hints of it uh, the idea of participatory art from Claire Bishop uh, of course the work of Hansier in pol uh, politics and police and Le Partage du Sensible and two uh, Brazilian intellectuals called uh, Pimentel e Vasconcelos in this text what are political aesthetic actions um, another sliding from art and politics to art and economy so understand the, the neoliberal condition that conditions everything and understand the new forms of exploitation and abuse of work, bodies, activities to surplus value of tran transnational corporations, finance and banks well, very broad but um, a, a very uh, fundamental for me interest to try to understand how does it work nowadays either in social movements, this uh, transformation of the idea of work uh, of from salary to uh, post salary as Veronica Gago will, will put it and it's try to understand this new situation in neoliberalist capitalism um, yeah, and in, in relation to surplus value. So context of hegemonic late capitalism or integrated capitalism as Guattari puts it. And um, some recent uh, thing I'm working on is that idea of neoliberalism from below from an Argentinian sociologist called Veronica Gago. Uh, that I found uh, here in Europe, so <laughs> uh, working on, still working on her idea. But that, that the main idea is that the implementation of neoliberalism is less totalitarian in societies with other economies in use. For example, uh, Latin America, where the welfare state was not fully imp implemented, and also the neoliberalism has. Uh, very specific issues in, in these territories so she is trying to foster the idea that the resistance of it is also specific and we, we could learn some things out of it 
And the last movement of this, the research is slides from art and politics to, oh no, this is the same one. That I just put other um, uh, authors I'm working with. So Boaventura, I already mentioned. The idea of dispossession from David Harvey is very important to me. Uh, Veronica Gago with neoliberalism from below, uh, and Paulo Virno, Boyana Kunst, <laughs> and Andrea Lepecki talking about this post for this labor, affective work, neoliberal subjectives and temporalities, this specific uh, post for this mo mo moment where work is mutating and where, where does it go to, and um, it was very useful for me to read your book, Boyana, to also see uh, what, what are the specificities from Latin America perspective, because some of some things that are really sa sad for this European continental European context don't don't fit for Latin America. So it's it's a of course it, they don't, but. For me, it's a very interesting relation to learn from these two perspectives. I think they have a lot to um, to tell us about this uh, integrated capitalism. Uh, and also the, an old idea uh, of social use of violence from Rosa Luxemburgo, which I'm also reading again, um, because as she... Uh, fosters also a feminist perspective. In my perspective, she, she didn't say she was feminist, but I think she, she has really important um, ideas of imperialism, of colonization, and also about this idea of use of violence. So it was, it's been important to me. So I put here some neoliberal logics. Of course, you already know it is just for us to to keep us in mind that idea of scarcity economy, which is in the base of economy as we know it from liberal, from Adam Smith to now, <laughs> is this idea that uh, the world is, uh, has is its scarcity, so we have to organize it through the commodity and through the money to satisfy our needs. The idea of competition, the idea of individuality and production of subjectivity through rationality. And I, I, I put some uh, more contemporary ideas of algorithm calculation of rationality, which means uh, the use of social media, how they calculate our interaction and our activity for the corporation <laughs> profits and to do the work for us suggesting mm -hmm. what kind of stuff we would like to see, what kind of stuff we would like to consume. Uh, in the end of the day, so it's about uh, consuming. So it's, it's also an, an interesting um, arena to understand these, uh, these technological changes, let's say the, the, the networks and the streets. How this, th does these two things relate to one another? So the idea, the persistence and renewed colonial relations, uh, life management, commodification, surplus value, expropriation or dispossession of common goods uh, from enclosures, the, the different enclosures we still see happening. Uh, what is, uh, I was thinking uh, some some months ago is that nowadays, for example, Facebook is the, the new enclosure of interaction of social media or Twitter, which means that the, this virtual space is controlled and um, used in private purposes. So we, we think that we are relating to one another, but we are giving our data for future calculations of consumerism. So uh, the f in Brazil, the f this first moment of uh, free network 
in the beginning of the 2000s was really, really powerful. We, we were thinking, wow, uh, the network space is a free space. We can use all of it. And then little by little, we started to see how regulations and how leaking things um, happen and what is the purpose of it all. And something that I found in uh, Boyana's uh, work is the temporary temporality of now, which is, I find it's very interesting to think that we are always thinking up to date, actualizing, so the notion of past and future becomes like blurred or, um, or um, trapped in this idea of now, that we have to respond now, to react now. Um, is it okay? Are you sleeping or are you with me? Yes? <laughs> okay, some still the framework of everything sliding from artworks to the work in the arts. Um, Boyana, in her books, she turns to the work of the artists, and I'm sliding a little bit the work in the arts uh, to try to figure out how uh, this specific work in the arts, either as artist, producer, um, collaborator, uh, audience, there is very interesting no notion from Ricardo Basbaum, he's a Brazilian uh, artist and theoretic, he says that the condition of the artist, the contemporary artist, is artist, etc. So, artist, producer, artist, pedagogue, artist, um, whatever you put it. And I find it very in, an, an interesting notion of of the contemporary art circuit. Um, already said about Pimentel and Vasconcelos, this idea of uh, political, statical actions. So actions that are in and out the art field, that's their idea. How can you uh, grasp some uh, actions that are not from the art field or not seen as artistic? but yet they foster very aesthetical political um, statements, let's say. So art has been interested in that for at least 20 years in this idea of social uh, choreography, participation. So this is another way of putting it out, j more interested in this, in staying in between art and non-art how could we really stick to that moment where you see that something is uh, statically, politically uh, very strong, but not forcefully in the art field? How, 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 what does it bring to us, to the art field and also to social movements? Be because as you will see, I will talk about one specific action that happened in Aldeia Maracanã, which is a, an urban in indigenous I follow for now eight years in Brazil. There was this um, last evacuation from the police from the territory in 2013, and one indigenous leader stayed uh, up in a tree for 26 hours resisting uh, police. So. This for me is an example of aesthetical polit political action. It's something that troubles the idea of uh, politics and statics because it's not uh, written somewhere that you cannot be in on, on a top of a tree. And it was a tree inside the territory of Aldeia Maracanã. So police was really pushing to, to get him out of there. Um, so uh, it has uh, political implications, very direct actions, but at the si same time, for me, it also creates an aesthetical, um, in terms of uh, the, the, the sharing of the sensible. What, what, is, what is that 
what is that he is doing up in the on the tree that changes us as testimonying it, as seeing it, as either uh, narrating it. What does this story tell you, and how you relate to it? Um, so two also important frameworks are feminist perspective. So Silvia Federici with the idea of reproductive labor and wage patriarchy, which uh, Veronica Gago will uh, turn into post-wage patriarchy because she, is, she will foster a lot that we live in a, in, in a world now where uh, wages are not the, the only, the main hegemonic uh, way of getting money. It's more about in-depth and uh, income. So you have a lot of small uh, works that uh, complement your income, not only your wage. Are you following that? Yes? More or less. It will be clear afterwards, but I'll, I'll just go, go on. Um, also, I put here some um, activists and uh, indigenous intellectuals, such as Sonia Guajajara, with the idea of, of body and land. She's a, she, was, she ran for vice president in the, in the last election, so she was really fostering the indigenous struggle for land. And she has a strong debate on, on land being uh, indigenous body. So the idea of property for indigenous people is not that you own the land, but uh, that you, you belong to that land. That's why you have to be there, because your ancestors were there, and you cultivate this land, and you, you, you make it richer. Uh, the, the Amazonian forest is not rich by chance. It's, it's thousands of years, millions of years, of uh, indigenous people cultivating it. So this idea also of environment as something natural, <laughs> as something that uh, is rich by itself, is really troubled by the indigenous struggle. It's, it's them who, who work in the soil, so the soil gets rich. So there is this uh, presence as well. Um, Okay, I put also Mujeres Criando, which is an autonomous uh, feminist movement in Bolivia, very important for, for the research, and other black lesbian feminists, such as Audre Lorde, uh, Spinoza Minoso, uh, which I heard that was here, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she's been very important uh, person to this uh, research. I'll just go through it. Also, the colonial and anti-colonial and non-heteronormative perspective. I put here Marielle Franco because she was also an intellectual, apart from being have been a, a, a politician. Monica Francisco, who is she's a, she's a politician and a community leader in Brazil. She's follower of Marielle Franco and others. So, moving. Um, so the idea is to relate neoliberal work and life in between this idea of social movements and artistic context. Just to get uh, uh, <laughs> one grasp of it. So let's go to the examples. The first one is the feminist movement called um, Women Against Cunha. Cunha was a deputy that um, was against abortion. And just before the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, he, or, and also during it, he was very responsible for uh, putting it forward, the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff. And he was making a lot of uh, law projects against uh, abortion in Brazil. It, it's not legalized in Brazil only in two cases, but very small cases and with no health care, so really going towards criminalization of women. So this was um, w one of the cases I brought, is this demonstration, Women Against Cunha. 
and I interviewed one of the um, the organizers. It's it's really odd actually to say it like this because it was a movement that uh, was gathered through Facebook. So there were a lot of organizers at the same time, but I talked to one of them and she said one very interesting thing is was that uh, it was a joy of being together, of women being together. So this stuck me uh, really strong, that idea of uh, being together on street and uh, enjoying it. That is something that uh, she, in her um, analysis, was not uh, a common case for demonstrations, street demonstrations. And these are some uh, posters of these demonstrations. What I find it interesting because they are all individual posters, which is something that will appear statically after 2013. So a lot of um, demands, different demands that were brought in, in, in individual posters. So I think uh, some theoricians were saying these demonstrations more like multitude, not, not masses anymore, but more like this kind of multitude where different perspective and different kinds of demands were together. Of course, we have to go with very slowly to make this uh, connection, but somehow it's, it's something that appears. And also the use of um, um, artistic uh, things during the demonstration, uh, artistic strategic, like painting uh, in all in, in red, uh, the slut walk I didn't bring here, but it was also another important moment in Brazil from 2011 on. So this idea of going on the street is really something that, is, that was strong until, let's say, the coup, these um, street demonstrations. Another important thing were online hashtags. So in the year of 2015, we had a lot like feminicide law, my first ha harassment, enough of silence, my secret friend, each one of them was referring to some theme. For example, my secret friends were denunciations of men that were harassing women, and you, nobody was talking about who it was, so my secret friends. So there was these uh, huge ways of hashtags and, and women really um, bringing out this aspect of uh, harassment. Uh, it's, it was not only in Brazil. We have, for example, Niuna Menos in, in Argentina, which was which is a, a street dem movement, but has its side of um, online activity. So I think this 2015 was a really strong moment for these uh, hashtags and mobilizations. And uh, now we see. Uh, in social media that the situation has already changed a lot because of surveillance, because of um, robots, the, the campaign of Bolsonaro putting some fake news. So we have uh, already a different scenario, let's say. But, but for this moment, this was really important. Um, one critic that uh, analysis actually that uh, Spinoza Mignoso uh, talks about this uh, feminist demonstration, which I find uh, very interesting to, to get it, to, to recall it, is that they are bourgeois, urban, heteronormative, most of them, uh, white mixed race, uh, heritage of feminists. So who has the the time and the money to be on streets like Friday afternoon, <laughs> for example. Yes. Um, can you just explain a little bit how you connect white and mixed race and what it's like Yes. Uh, yes. Yes, of course. Um, it's uh, because race, race has this uh, relational as aspect. 
always. So in Brazil, for example, in, in Europe, I can tell by myself. In Europe, I'm not white. But in Brazil, I'm white. Because in relation to uh, class, gender, and position, and access that I have, I am seen as white. I just put slash mixed race because it's, it's problematic also, this idea of, uh, of, of putting in fixed categories, just to mark that uh, it's relational, depending on where you are and to whom you talk to. So, but um, from this uh, perspective, from Brazilian perspective, it, I'm really white middle class white and this is um, this is a recent phenomena actually to be sp broadly spoken out and I um, relate it also to the leftist mo moment uh, of government in Brazil where other where black uh, where women where indigenous were really forcing to whiteness um, to come out of its neutrality. So this is a huge debate in Brazil nowadays from like ten, eight years now. And the Brazilians that are here <laughs> can also uh, contribute to, to that because from other cities there are all others' uh, perspective, but there is this um, awakening, let's say. It's not an awakening, but just to rapidly say that uh, this consciousness of whiteness and white fragility is really, really strong in Brazil now. But uh, here I'm not white, so that's why I put mixed race. Because, of course, I'm also talking about myself in this uh, street demonstration. Is it okay? Yeah, and, but then but you would, would you put this also then in, like the, in, in contrast to something like black or indigenous as kind of clear, clear categories of clear social categories in the world as opposed to mixed race or are you trying to because I see this kind of white mixed race being used like in the same let's say the same class or the same yes 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 but it's, this is a huge debate in Brazil because they, they really invented, f for whitewashing the, the, <laughs> the population, for example, they invented a category called pardo. Pardo is this color. So this color would <laughs> say not, not white, not black, not indigenous, not la la la, so you were this. And a lot, of, a lot of people still uh, see themselves themselves as pardo. So this has to do also with an, a historical debate of whitewashing the population from governmental policies of, um, for example, uh, facilitating European immigrants to come to Brazil and also not acknowledging uh, the the heritage of slavery in Brazil as an important component and the indigenous genocide. So I, I should talk only about that, but very briefly, it's, it's a huge debate, this. Um, and another uh, thing that uh, Spinoza Minoso puts that I find very interesting is that idea of NGOs and relationships to imperialistic um, strategies. She, she comes to say that after 1990s, so in, with the installation of a neoliberalism as an hegemonic um, system in Latin America, there is this, um, this phenomena of, of fostering NGOs so some institutionalization of grassroots movements and, and feminist per, uh, struggles are not out of it, like the UN, the NU, no, UN or NU, NU United Nations, UN uh, Nations uh, for Women, these um, 
these branches that put a feminist agenda but also um, limit their agendas. For example, she says, uh, Spidoza Minhoso, about uh, autonomists like Mujeres Criando in Bolivia. Maria Galindo really fostered some activities that do not depend or support on NGO um, organizations. So there's also this debate of autonomy and um, NGO neoliberal strategies to deal with these, um, these feminists, which is the case here, um, issues. Okay, um, so one thing I must still do is to uh, interview uh, indigenous, uh, I'm doing interview with women indigenous uh, for a review in visual arts just to, um, just to broaden this idea of uh, middle class uh, street demonstrations up to indigenous uh, and black movement, so this is something I still have to do when I come back to Brazil. And I would like to work with idea of uh, Veronica Gago of feminist economy, work on the pragmatics of financialization of life, and on the idea of indebtedness, which is a very concrete way of, um, of acknowledging the financial system in our lives is to be in debt all the time. That's a very, very strong idea that uh, Gagu puts, and I like very much that she brings it to, a, to, a, to an everyday materiality, this, this idea of finance or of global finance as something ruling the world, but it's not that abstract. It's really concreteness of uh, extracting your money, of you putting your money in the bank or having the needs to uh, take uh, money and be in debt, this really creates uh, a precarization in, in Gago's point of view, and I find it uh, very interesting. And I bring a, a quote from Maria Galindo, we are building a movement that builds social connections, a movement that said, that says, you are not going to solve anything alone. You are not going to solve housing, work, education, health, freedom, dignity, happiness. We cannot do it alone. So this would be the, the reverse of the idea of neoliberalism. Of course, it's not that simple, as I say, because it's not the oppositions, because we are in this uh, neoliberalist condition. Uh, but um, for me, Maria Galindo and uh, Mujeres Creando are really pushing this to how can we really build something uh, with solidarity amongst women, for example, um, going to the bank and trying to renegotiate debts from women. Women all together go to the bank, they really do this, or they, um, they lend money not to uh, depend on banks. So this, these are small practical actions that really are pushing this idea that we have to be in debt all the time and that uh, neoliberalism is some, something that uh, devastates your, your life. Of course it devastates our lives, but y you have some um, uh, negotiation mar margins, even though they're, they must look very small, but still they, they can be effective somehow. Uh, and talking about the black women's visibility, um, this is a poster of who killed Marielle, uh, and this is the photo of the black women's march. I would just uh, mark that for black women, they, a lot of them, the interviews I did, a lot of them, they resist to call themselves feminists. They prefer to call themselves as black women. And it has to do with the, a tradition in Brazil that feminists are 
um, most of the time middle class liberal uh, women uh, looking for jobs and positions so very much into liberal feminism so this uh, marking of being black women and black women's march is really a, a, a detachment from this idea of feminists it's just to mark that there are a lot of tensions in this arena I, I won't go deeper into it but just just for you to know <laughs> that this is a, a real debate also because uh, feminists in the 70s were very much linked to dictatorship censorship and and the position of the church the catholic church so themes like abortion could not be uh, fostered by that time so there is this all these specificities and talking about lesbian visibility, which is uh, nowadays um, growing, I think, and it, it relates a lot with the black women, women's marches. It's very interesting to see that a lot of um, women that are representative from the um, lesbian, lesbians movements in Rio, for example, which is the case I'm, I'm looking at, uh, are lesbian, are black lesbian. So there's something interesting about it, about this sensibility, I think. And this is uh, Monica Benicio, uh, Marielle's partner, now, uh, ma now widow. And I would like to show um, just this, the first part of this documentary on Marielle and uh, Monica, because uh, now I'm, I'm going to the lesbian movement uh, example. And this documentary was made by The Guardian, yes, and um, it's before the election of Bolsonaro. It, it was like September or October 2018. Um, Are you seeing no? Why is it not appearing? Yet? Yeah, I'm I'm trying to slide it. Is it that? No. It's the other way. Okay. Brasil, um olhar muito racista, né? E que tende sempre a criminalizar tanto o negro quanto a pobreza. Quando o Bolsonaro acende, embora a gente ainda não saiba como vai ser o governo dele, o que já fica um legado de violência, de ódio, né? De determinação do ódio um contra o outro. Nós somos frutos de um processo de resistência mesmo. E é óbvio que a execução da Maria, o apagamento da Maria, faz com que esse processo fique mais potente. E isso seja traduzido não só na nossa votação expressiva, mas de tantas outras mulheres, né? Marielle era uma, para além de tudo, uma figura política em ascensão. Marielle era parada na rua para poder é, ser abraçada, para as pessoas dizerem, você me representa, tira uma foto comigo. Então, isso era a Marielle política. Tinha a Marielle mulher, que era uma mulher negra, favelada, lésbica, que é o corpo mais descartável dentro dessa cidade. Alô, galera! Estamos terminando aí esse processo eleitoral. A partir das 22 horas, o Chetá não pode mais fazer campanha. A partir das 22 horas... Marielle foi a segunda mulher mais votada para vereadora no Brasil. Isso é um fenômeno. É fundamental a gente ocupar aqui a tribuna, principalmente num dia como o de hoje, no qual mais uma vida foi ceifada de uma criança de 7 anos na maré. A gente tem um senhor que está defendendo a ditadura e falando alguma coisa contrária a isso. Eu peço que a presidência da casa, no caso de maiores manifestações, estiver atrapalhar a minha fala, 
assim proceda como a gente faz quando a tribuna interrompe qualquer vereador. Não serei interrompida, não aturo o interrompimento dos vereadores desta casa, não aturarei de um cidadão que vem aqui e não sabe ouvir a posição de uma mulher eleita. Ok, just for you to have some images of her. <laughs> of, okay. So, um, with the case of uh, Marielle, she's uh, a case in, in herself, but I, I will deal with um, her struggle within the, the Council of Rio de Janeiro to foster the Lesbian Visibility Day. That would be the 29th of August. And she did, she did this struggle, this, uh, she put to voting into this house uh, with the articulation of lesbian movements. So this was really interesting to see and I made some interviews out of it of the relation of how Marielle really could um, gather what she was hearing on the street because she was not only uh, linked to the lesbian uh, movement but she, she was black, she was mother, she was from favela. Uh, uh, with the, the feminist movement she was really someone really sensitive to, to the struggles that were um, said and debated on street and really put it into a, the council and we have to understand that the council is a very conservative um, con context, arena so she was a, 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 a minority in this house but the way she addressed, the force that she has when, when she addressed to um, either someone who was uh, praising dictatorship or other council uh, men really created something in this council. So she was uh, really disturbing the status quo of deciding things, putting this agenda, this grassroots social movements agendas. So she, one thing she, she always said uh, was that she... Uh, had to, we had to favelizar the council, which means we have to acknowledge the ways in which the favelas uh, brought uh, solutions to the city and to put it into represent representational politics. So this uh, really trying to make a bridge and being a, def a defensor for human rights for over 10 years before being elected gave her a lot of um, experience of listening to these um, demands and really trying to put it into an institutional uh, arena debate. Um, one other thing that... Um, Marielle also said was that um, she got from the Ubuntu philosophy, I am because we are. Eu sou porque nós somos. It's uh, Nelson Mandela's quotations of I'm here representing because we are all here. So this idea of uh, community, of bringing up community, not an idealistic and perfect com community, the co a community full of conflicts, full of uh, demands, opposing sometimes demands, but this, uh, this very idea of knowing that she was uh, representing people that could not be there was really um, at stake. And she always referred to it as the black women's ancestors way of dealing also with, with the problems the, that, that they're always and also the Afro, Afro descendants uh, traditions in Brazil that always uh, start a talk for example praising Exu which is a, a, a divinity that uh, opens the ways so no, relating to time differently than only this 
term, <laughs> this four-year term, or this temporality of now, but putting it some complexities of ancestors, of communal uh, ways of gathering, and putting it into the institutional politics. So this is her that you saw, and this was the day of the voting. I won't. I have a, a part of it, but uh, I won't. I will just keep this. If, if you keep this in mind, because already one hour that I'm talking. Um, and this is uh, Monica Benicio, her widow, uh, with uh, in the this this year samba school um, in Rio de Janeiro, which was uh, a rewriting of history. And she was uh, Monica Benicio really now stands. For this, for this legacy of Marielle, such as the, their family, but uh, I, I saw it also as a political static action for her to be there. And um, I'll show you a, a small extract of an action made in uh, Casa das Pretas, which was the last place that Marielle was. This is one week afterwards, the, uh, the execution of Marielle, what they did on streets. And okay, thanks. <laughs> the street sign there. And I'll, I'll just finish with two more things. One is, uh, I'll only say it, uh, one um, council broke the street sign. So this is one thing. And, and the street sign is in the council now, as a, in the wall, on the wall. And uh, another action that is, uh, Monica Benicio putting the street sign of Marielle Franco in front of the council in Rio de Janeiro 
and the action of uh, Sensacionalista, which is a, a website that uh, made a crowdfunding for 1,000 uh, street signs of Marielle after this deputy had teared out these, uh, these street signs. I didn't talk about the <laughs> Occupy Tree and the urban indigenous, but I think we should um, try to talk a little bit. And then if I have time, I can try to relate to what I said before, this idea of uh, economics and, and yeah. But for the time being, I think we can stop here. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, that I did with the indigenous, uh, uh, urban indigenous leader called Urutal Guajajara. And we did a lecture performance where he explained this um, Occupy Tree, this event that he stayed 26 hours on the top of the tree from his point of view, from the land and from indigenous cosmologies. And I, from my part, talk about the erasure in between us. Why is his culture not mine as well as, as being mine? So what, what are the things that I don't see that I can't relate to it? And how, how could I relate to it? So this is the, the lecture performance. What, what is, it, it is, is it about? So the moment uh, where I, I said, OK, this is a performance a lecture performance. So how can we deal with the art circuits? So I understand that I had to bring up some specific strategies. For example, um, always have relation to Aldeia Maracanã back. So if the money we got, uh, part of the money is for the Aldeia Maracanã, or if we go to um, festivals. We went to Bahia last, last year in a festival called um, art as struggle and the thing I, I asked the curators is that they brought an indigenous leader from Bahia to talk to Rutao so we were presenting the, 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 the lecture performance but he was also doing something else so this was the strategy I, I developed with him for us to always do something that was not expected from the artistic context to feed the, the struggle. This is a, in a specific case. Um, but for, for the other cases, I, I looked at the feminist and the lesbian movements. I find they, they are better off like that because they have more like an, uh, a direct action into an inter intervention in politics that everything I saw, of course, uh, I didn't see all, but everything I saw that tried to relate to it in the art context was less strong than the fact itself. You know, the street signs was already for me, a, could be read as a performance, but not not in the artistic context. If I put this in the artistic context in a festival, it, it disappears for me. So th it's this tension of where to put and, and how to name it. Was it kind of a response? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just thinking, I'm just a little bit confused with this word. Maybe it's a terminology problem or context. Mm. Because for me, what you are describing are actually is really connected also with the uh, because there is no political gesture which is in the same time also not aesthetic, mm -hmm. just, uh, political action, or it's very much connected with modes of expression, with aesthetic gestures, and I see this very much, and I think that belongs actually to the core of politics: how you are public, mm -hmm. how you present, how you read. It's, it's aesthetic belongs, you know, like this. Would, so for me, this would be very much connected to that, to this core of politics. And I think it's very valuable what you say, that there are other uh, modes of expression or cultures which are then coming out, like the whole tradition of samba or dressing like that and so on. So this is something what I think can become very powerful. It's just that I'm in my mind when I'm listening to you just uh, juggling with this word context. Mm. And how you know, no, it's, it's very good that you brought this up because I'm, I'm, I'm still struggling with this word. Mm -hmm. So if you have another suggestion to, to replace it, because, um, mm -hmm. but because context may, may sound that something is out of context and something is mm -hmm. on context. It's not that what I mean, but at the same time, context uh, creates a, uh, a field to look at. There's a field, a field around the uh, the artistic thing or artistic practice. So I, I'm really 
still thinking of, of if it's the right word, actually. I didn't find any better um, word. If you have suggestions for me, <laughs> I would love to hear it. <laughs> Say it again, please. actions, because in mostly the artistic context, uh, there, is, there are certain pieces who are coming to watch uh, actions or uh, presentations, and if the social movement decides to make protests on the street, we don't choose a certain... I mean, there is not a, a, a specific audience, but we address the people on the street. Is this for you the specificity of the artistic? Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think so because, for example, in the street sign um, thing, it it was really um, it was really planned how it would would happen. So one no no it was it was really planned from crowdfunding to the hour that they hand out the street signs to the photo. This is really a choreographed photo. But uh, still, it doesn't take out the, this, this power, I think. So um, maybe it's not about uh, being uh, passers-by or if you are prepared to go there, but uh, the, the effect that it has. For a, for example, this action was ne is never. I have never seen anyone talk about it in the artistic context. I mean, as something as performance. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> maybe. Maybe not yet. But but for me, it's very striking. The one that uh, burned himself? No, no, he just oh. was standing. He mm. just went and stand, stood silent. And what happened is that it generated also uh, a lot through social media or like uh, different kind of networking people start uh, joining this mm. action. So then it became kind of a, a, a mobilization, like mm. a bigger mobilization. Mm -hmm. um, I think it goes on these borders of like, is this an artistic action? Is this a political protest? Also producing as a creative modes of political gestures. Mm -hmm. huh? 
Mm -hmm. uh, because I think like art in this sense is also a very, very strong neoliberal machine for yes. adopting these yes. gestures. Yes. And this is where Yeah, yeah, that's good. Now yeah, yeah, now now together. it's it's clear yeah. for for me. Um yeah, I what I um am trying to think now is that some um these uh, artistic practice or events that happen they cannot be only read from the artistic circuit. There are other things at stake there that relates to other uh, cultures mm -hmm. and to other economies. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying about other economies, that economies that are not uh, circumscribed in the art circuit. So they are not made for seeing, uh, sharing, touring. For example, the, this lecture performance I do, I, I will never tour with it. It's not possible. It, it's, it's not because it's not about that. It's about it's about bringing context and doing more than expected in some circles. So um, I'm thinking that uh, perhaps. A way to get out of this trap of neoliberal commodities, artistic commodities, is to um, acknowledge and uh, and see how some events they they have a lot of layers happening at the same time that cannot be reduced to, to art or to artistic context, and another meanings, for example, the the the, the re rebirth of the street sign of Marielle is also uh, bringing about the Black Panthers strategies to put this is uh, this is another track of thought that has nothing to do with performance or artistic context so these these layers they they can uh, happen at the same time and um, and also with this other economies or feminist economies that uh, Veronica Gago was trying to say that, uh, and, and I put some very uh, premature, let's say, or uh, provisional ideas from scarcity economy to some kind of feedback economy, which is uh, a, it's an invented word of mine, but it's it would be the the, the way of uh, indigenous some uh, ethnicities of indigenous culture to think about the land, that you have to enrich the land, that you have to feed the land and not to take it from the land. So what would it be to, to think of a feedback economy, for example, uh, to try to get out of this neoliberal trap? Um, again, uh, with the idea of competition, what is that if we put also solidarity on it? Not one or the other, as we are used to, to think. Either you are uh, on competition, either you are only in solidarity. But what about these two things happening together? What, does, what do it do to the economy? It's um, popular economies in Brazil or solidarity, solidarity solidarity economies in Brazil work a lot like that. It's not about getting out of new liberties because it's not possible, but how can you do something else than doing this? So uh, that would be, uh, I think, the, the effort I'm doing here. How can uh, we read these, these events from different perspectives as well, not only from artistic, but cultural and economical perspective. Oh, God. you also read the artistic differently or what notion of artistic Yes, yes. Because I was thinking more about the aesthetic of the political. Mm. The political in a way that you're focusing on the kind of originality or kind of practices that are performed in it. Um, mm. So it's not really Yeah, so for, for the part I, I have presented, yes, but of yeah. Struggle, you mm. know, of course, mm. performance art plays always a role in it, mm. but it has a different component of 
got maybe more the confidence that you have line out of collective action, of commonality, of, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're also proposing some things in the artistic context, you know? Yes, yeah. Uh, the thing is, um, my struggle, really, <laughs> is to, to try to get this uh, political aesthetical and not to, because they are always related to artistic, mm -hmm. really fastly, <laughs> really um, have this, uh, could have this other artistic perspective. So I don't want to really uh, turn, turn away in the research because it's somehow where I come from. So I'm not, I cannot detach my <laughs> my perspective from the artistic one. That's why I I'm still um, struggling mm. with it. So keep it a little bit more. So it's in orange that because I'm still struggling. Maybe by the end of the the research I'll have some something to propose on this artistic thing. But for the timing and f and for these. Um, because I, I um, just to, to clarify that I voluntarily um, took the do am taking the doctorate out of the arts on the communication and culture department. So it's also a, a, a journey for myself. And, but I, I don't want to leave this artistic context because I think it maybe in some cases it has potentialities. Not maybe, surely, but um, it's something I'm on my way still. But I don't, I don't want to leave it like that and say, oh, it's a, not not to solve it, but really, how could could I be in in between <laughs> these two things? One thing that I am thinking of is to make a thesis that is two-part thesis. This first part, let's say first or most part of the thesis, like political, aesthetical, and the artistic. So they are separated, but they cannot be completely separated. They are part of the same thesis because uh, from the way I write, the, the also the authors that I'm bringing f um, bringing forward are also from the artistic field. So it's something that I think it's important to, to point out. Actually, in, in, in relation to academic visibility and politics, it's something, you know, maybe utopian, but <laughs> it's important for my um, way. The first uh, is not really an interview, it's the lecture performance that we did together. So it's, it's been a long-term collaboration now, eight years. So I started to go to Aldea Maracana as a citizen, not as an artist nor as a researcher. I stayed there for six months like anyone else, doing Tupi Guarani lessons, going to um, screen movies, and then when this Occupy Tree thing happened, I said, wow, now it's the time to work with him really directly. And then I, I invited him to, to do this lecture performance together. So that's, that's one way of collaborating. The, now what I'm doing is interviewing uh, indigenous women. So really interviewing, posing questions and what about the why why you don't call yourself feminist? Why? Uh, what are the reasons? What doesn't fit? What is out of frame for you? How do you understand differently this womanhood thing? What is so? I'm, I'm and the intention of it is try to uh, get out of this middle class feminist, which I, which is, I'm formed into this. So it's trying to. 
to go elsewhere. <laughs> and also the, the black feminist movement uh, is, is all about that, also to intersectionally make other questions to, to women and feminists. So this is, and it will be an article in a Brazilian review, uh, a dialogue of me and two other, trialogue, not dialogue, <laughs> Uh, me and two other uh, indigenous women from Aldeia Maracanã, so it's an ongoing thing still. But it will be a written work, and I think I will profit it for the research. So the collaboration with the indigenous is really n as a supporter and as a, a punc punctual um, collaborator in some works. And sometimes I, I, for example, I work at uh, this uh, Safechi, which is a federal institution. And last year we did um, an indigenous week on school. So all the, the speakers were indigenous. And this was awesome for, uh, for the students and for us teachers ourselves to, to, you know, to listen to them and to, to really um, make bonds with them. So it's really, really different kinds of collaborations in educational and citizen and artistic context. Did I answer you? Thank you. Go back and finish the writing and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>